and that is endowed by our Creator. No matter the age, and especially no matter how marred uh, by sin and affliction, human beings are created in the image of God. And I believe we have a responsibility because of that. And the same God who grants life and who imparts His image on to all human beings is the God through the blood of Christ that gives new life. No evil decision in the world, no human activity, however grotesque, will defeat the life-giving blood of Jesus. And we have kind of two verses that we're going to start with. One is um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Praise to the Father above, who gives life to the dead and who calls into existence the things that do not exist, we're told in Romans. So I want to take a look at, at two main perspectives here. And if you can pull up the uh, uh, slide for the, for the beginning. Uh, the first is honoring the creator of life. And I want to kind of look at that in three aspects. One is that God is the author of life, that God set man apart from before birth, and that God commands us to protect life. And then I want to look at those exact same three things under the context of honoring the creator of spiritual life. So we're going to look at, at those three points in, from two different perspectives. So those are the perspectives for honoring the creator of life, and then we've got those exact same uh, points for honoring the creator of spiritual life. We see in, in this first aspect of God is the author of life, we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing. Also in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, formed from the dust of the earth, God breathed life. In verse 7 it says, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life the man became a living creature. Can you imagine <laughs> seeing that happen? Taking dust from the ground and forming it. A form so much so that it had nostrils to be breathed into and it came alive. First time in history. Out of nothing. In chapter 2, verse 21, it says, So God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it up its place with flesh. God created woman. And in Psalm chapter 139, verses 13 through 18, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in the secret, in the depths of the earth. This fact that God is the author of life is, is indisputable. There's just no other way to come to this conclusion. And what joy and what amazement and what adoration is due Him because of this. We also see that God set man apart from before birth. And just a couple of examples. One is Jochebed, the mother of, of Moses. You'll remember that God had blessed Israel um, and they had grew in number and grew in the land and Pharaoh saw that they were a great people, even mightier than the Egyptians. So he told the midwives to kill the male babies. But even in these circumstances, Moses was born. How? Why? He was set apart from before birth. Another example is Sarah giving birth at age 90. If that, a, a feat in and of itself. 
So much so that there was even some reluctancy and to be able to believe that that could happen. <laughs> the statistics were absolutely against her having a baby at all. And in Genesis chapter 17, it says, And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael, Ishmael might come before you. And God said, No, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him, an everlasting covenant for his offspring and after him. I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you this time next year. <laughs> he was set apart from before birth. A year before his birth, before conception, he was set apart. And then also Mary, the mother of Jesus. Having never known a man, she conceived and gave birth. And in Luke chapter 10, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 1, verse 30. It says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High God. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. In all three of these circumstances, completely different, we see that God had set people apart from before birth. Significant circumstances. Some would even say that they were impossible circumstances. And yet not so with God. God was at work causing His will to be accomplished in the birth of the children in these families. And this same God is no less at work today in our lives and in our families. Just one statistic here while we think through that, that God is the author of life and He sets people apart. Oklahoma has 35 Evangelical Christian Pregnancy Resource Centers. That, that would, I would think that would be reason for a celebration and applause. But it's so shadowed, overshadowed, by 1.4 million, I believe was the number. Josh and I were talking up here just a little bit before the service. We, we are living in a modern day Holocaust. This is our Holocaust. And the silence is deafening. So what are we to do in response? Well, one of the things that we're commanded to do is God commands us to protect life, to honor life. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13 says, You shall not murder. We see that God values human life because every human life bears His image. To devalue human life is to show disrespect for God Himself. Thus, we're not surprised that the Ten Commandments, human life, is highly valued. Thou shalt not murder translates that we should not kill or refers to the willful and, and deliberate taking of a human life. Throughout the Old Testament, the taking of another human life was strictly prohibited. I Meaning even if it happened by accident, even if it had happened, the taking of a human life by an animal, the animal was to be slain. And if it was by accident, the person, there was, uh, uh, there was a course of action that needed to be taken, even if it was accidental. That's the value that God has placed on human life. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus coming to teach the scriptures and to live them out so that people could see what these laws really meant how, and, and what it looked like for them to be lived out. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, he says, You have heard that it has been said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, 
is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says you fool will be in danger of hell fire. An important part of this sermon was to show what the meaning of and the value of life looked like. According to the established procedure, one suspected of murder was subject to judgment. That was a normal pattern then and today. Jesus continued on, however, in verse 22 to show the true intention of this law. God not only prohibits the external action of premeditated killing, but also bans the internal attitude of anger that so often leads to murder. According to Jesus, sinful anger is an offense before God that causes the perpetrator to be subject to judgment as well. To say you fool is another way to insult a fellow human that's made in God's image. In the eyes of God who created all of human life, such an offense deserves hellfire. The teaching of Jesus could not be clearer that each human life is to have value, and it does have value. And his followers were to act and speak in ways that are based on this value. This kind of got me to thinking about this question. What, what kind of expressions of sinful anger would Jesus have mentioned in our context today. I'm fairly sure that no one said Raka um, this week. <laughs> but what are the things that we say and what are the things that we do that distribute or that, uh, that manifest, that, that display our, our hearts of anger? Something to think about. And the glorious news of the gospel is that regardless of where we find ourselves here, whether we're dealing with anger or whether we're dealing with um, the, the aftermaths of, of abortion or whether we're, we're, we just may be rolling through life and not really be valuing life at all, not even thought about it. The glorious news of the gospel is that our Father bids us to come and repent. And that is all. But that is everything. So whether we found ourselves actively involved, completely apathetic, uh, not even thinking about this thing at all, or maybe antagonistic to some people at work or that we know that are pro-life, the gospel bids us repent, come to Him. One other interesting note, President Ronald Reagan issued a proclamation on January the 16th, 1984, which is one of the reasons why we are celebrating this today. Designated Sunday, January the 22nd as Na a National Sanctity of Life Day, noting that it was the 11th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Sanctity of Human Life Sunday is nationally recognized on the third Sunday every January. You say, well, what can I do? I'm not president and I can't declare a national holiday or just a national day of, of, of focus and celebration. I can't do that. We're going to talk about that. One of the things that's important to realize is that laws will come and laws will go. What may be legal today would be illegal tomorrow. What may have historically been illegal may all of a sudden be legal. Our culture has legalized many things throughout the years. But that does not make them morally right. What God creates is, is marvelous. He said that it was good. He said that it was very good. So I'd like to shift our focus just a little bit now to look at honoring the creator of spiritual life. 
Interestingly enough, the God that brings about physical birth is also the God that brings about spiritual birth. In fact, we have the promise that anyone who will come to Him and repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in Him and follow Him, they will be saved. They will experience this spiritual life. And God is the author of this spiritual life. Our salvation is owed to Jesus Christ. Our salvation originated in the infinite love of God. He so loved the world that He gave His only Son. And whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He became man, taught, labored, suffered, died, and ever lives. He is our only Savior. The great end of His suffering was our eternal salvation. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, the writer says, For it was fitting that He for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Also in chapter 5, verse 9, And he being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who would obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And in Ephesians and in Romans, Romans tells us for those that he foreknew he predestined and he conformed to the image of his son. Sounds like he's the author of that. Even before we're aware. God also sets us apart before our spiritual birth. We see in the call of Jeremiah in chapter 1 and verse 5, Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you to a prophet to the nations. Here we, see, we, we saw earlier in Scripture that, that God had predestined this life to exist. Even before conception. And now we see here in several passages that God does that same thing before our spiritual birth. He, he sets us apart. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. And in, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 41, it said, Then Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, and the baby leapt in her womb. <laughs> what an amazing thing. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul said in, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Paul understood that not only had God set him apart before birth to have life, but he had set him apart before birth that his mission, his spiritual life was set in action. And he was called at that point. Jesus the Christ in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come up on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child will be born. He will be called Holy, the Son of God. Isn't it interesting how we see these parallels, not only in physical life, but also in spiritual life? That God calls us and sets us apart, creates us, enables us, allows us to have and experience life in both perspectives. Also, we see that God commands us to protect, to honor spiritual life. When we think about protecting spiritual life, I suspect that many of us could testify in times in our life when God has provided for us and protected us in our spiritual walk with Him. And how can we be a part of how God provides and honors and protects this spiritual life in others? Can we, how can we prepare ourselves to be 
responsible for new believers that he is birthing into his kingdom. The more I thought about this, the more I came back to the great commandment. <laughs> so now you may be thinking, what in the world does the great commandment have to do with this? <laughs> With this spiritual life, we're to prepare ourselves for to help God and, and doing His work in others. I would expect that this topic is much like most in our spiritual lives, that it's more of a heart issue than anything else. We can say that we want to be a part of God doing His kingdom work. We want to be a part of Him birthing spiritually. How do we do that? I think the first place we have to start is with our own hearts. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These commandments lay at the heart and literally at the center of of our purpose statement. Bethel exists to enable disciple makers to follow Christ, love God, love others, and serve the world. Loving of God and loving of others is this exact command. And five years ago or so, Pastor led us through teaching to make sure we understood and that we could grab a hold of these two. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through and read uh, all of the, the passages, but love for God exhibits itself in several different ways in our lives. It manifests itself in a delight and a commitment to obey. It's a saving response. It manifests itself in love for others. And obviously loving others... Um, true love for others is sourced in God's gift and command in His teaching. True love for others is active and abiding. If you study the Scriptures very long at all, these two foundational ideas of loving God and loving others really are at the core of everything we should be doing, including honoring and protecting spiritual life. Our love for God demonstrates itself in the way that Christ's love did, and He was willing to give of Himself. So how do we protect and how do we honor spiritual life? Live out godly lives so that everyone can see a difference and so num some new believers have a pattern to follow. I think that's ingrained in the Great Commission. The same instruction, guidance, and protection that Jesus provides His disciples is the command for all believers to provide for one another. The disciple-maker should provide instruction in sharing the Scriptures, guidance in how to live, and protection from the world system to not be caught up here. Not only is disciple-making the way that Jesus has prescribed to bring new believers into the church and grow church membership, it is the way for those new believers to be taught how to live the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. So how do we protect and how do we promote spiritual life? We studied this a few years back in Real Life Discipleship. First, we share. At the beginning of the discipleship process, we intentionally share the gospel with those who are spiritually dead. And we purposely look for such opportunities with those who are spiritual infants. What it means to be a disciple of Christ. This is a way we actively and tangibly demonstrate that we honor spiritual life. Second, we connect. As people begin to grow in their faith, an intentional disciple-maker helps them connect to God and to others and to their purpose in the church. When you come to Christ, you have a new purpose. You have a new reason for living.
At this level, the intentional disciple maker emphasizes relational nature of discipleship. Next is to train to minister. The disciple maker is nurturing and becoming a spiritual young adult. And as they mature, the intentional disciple maker trains spiritual young adults to use their gifts and abilities to minister to others. And the fourth, release to be a disciple maker. The disciples are becoming spiritual parents and are accepting the responsibilities to intentionally disciple others. So let's think just for a minute. Given these two perspectives, how do you honor life? How do I honor the physical life that God gives? One thing we can do is pray. Pray for the lives of the unborn. Pray for people considering abortion. Pray for those who counsel others. Pray for doctors and those who run clinics. And interestingly enough, if you've engaged in prayer very long, your heart will begin to change. We can give. Give to pregnancy centers. That's one of the things that we've been invited to do today, to pray and to give. To give to help purchase materials and resources. Give to help with salaries. Give to help with buying paint for walls that need to be painted. We talked about those this morning <laughs> out in the foyer. We can also volunteer. Volunteer to help put together materials that need to be handed out or maybe hand out the materials themselves. Volunteer to be a kind and loving friend to some of your neighbors or coworkers who are in distress. We can also vote for like-minded legislators, presidents, and others in position of influence. And on the other side of that, how do we honor spiritual life? Well, we just went through those. Share the gospel. And more importantly, than just saying things with your mouth, live as a follower of Christ before friends and coworkers and family members. We were speaking with a couple that had ministered overseas for years. And we're reminded that even in studies they would have in their homes, the women that would come to these studies would see her husband and say, man, I, I sure wish I had a husband that, <laughs> that treated me like your husband treats you. What an amazing display of the gospel for us to simply live as we've been called to live. And you say, well, I, that's not simple. I, I know. I understand. But we've got to be about that business, sharing our lives with others, sharing new habits to those who are new in their walk. They may not know what praying looks like. They may not know how to even feed themselves on the Word. Coming on Sunday mornings or maybe Sunday nights, maybe the only intake in scriptures they get and they need someone to say there's a lot of things you can do to get the Bible continue to flowing through you and to be able to feed yourself through the week connect others to God to other groups connect them to a new purpose and then train them to minister we're actively engaging some folks here in different things that they may not have done before. Thank you for being willing, by the way. <laughs> we need to be trained to minister. I can promise you this isn't easy. <laughs> I don't do this all the time. It's not an easy thing for me. But this opportunity has given me an, an, an avenue to develop that I, I hadn't done before. And after we have provided opportunities and equipped others to minister, to release them so that they will be disciple makers. 
explaining the process and release them to go and make disciples on their own. As we think about the things that we've looked at in the scriptures and, and thought about, we are to honor the creator of all life, be it our physical life or be it our spiritual life. We need to honor him. He alone is worthy to be praised. He alone is worthy of our time. He alone is worthy of my life and your life dedicated to following Him and all that He would have us to do. Let's pray.